Hi guys and welcome to today's Malasan counseling session. Um, as you can already tell by the title, today we are uh, going to talk about scenes. Um, the man himself, Stephen Erickson, has only recently said in an interview um, that he would um, love some fans to talk about their favorite scenes and um, my colleague Niffelrock has already done this and just for the sake of um, reducing the number of scenes a little bit I have decided to just focus on particularly emotional scenes so um, this video is going to have spoilers for uh, the whole series up to the end of Crippled God so if you haven't finished the series then um, please don't watch this video. <laughs> so um, I've been trying to choose a bunch of characteristics um, in order to give a little bit of a structure to the video and also to kind of Mm, analyze a little bit what makes those scenes so memorable and makes them stand out. So um, <clears throat> the characteristics that I chose are the one sentence that really kills you, then imagery, um, gestures and reactions from other characters, um, the witnessing perspective from another character who isn't necessarily directly involved, and then finally, interactions between characters and a shared history. So, um, the first category I want to talk about is that one sentence that's usually at the end of a emotional scene. And you probably all know what kind of sentence I'm referring to here, uh, because Stephen Erickson is so good at writing those sentences. Um, I could have chosen... Um, a number of examples here but there are two that particularly stood out to me and the first one um, is uh, from the crippled god from uh, the end um, of the last chapter when Harlow comes home and um, of course we have this situation of a mother who um, is having trouble accepting and loving her son because her son was the result of rape and <clears throat> so he's always a reminder for her of that horrible thing that happened to her. Um, but Harlow on the other hand he is really longing for his mother's love and um, in their relationship you can really feel that the importance of that bond between a son and his mother and there is just nothing that can replace a mom, um, no matter who raises you or um, what the situation is, a child is always going to long for mom. And then um, Harlow has been away and um, there he meets uh, Binesk and he um, tells him about his mother and there is the scene where he talks about Daruchistan and the city. In the city there are mothers and it could just really feel how much he longs for his mom. And then we, when he comes home, um, Stoney finally decides to face her past for her son because she then says um, those memories aren't good, this wasn't a good time, but then Harlow says that's not true, there was me. And then um, Stony's decision here is a decision to face the good in a sea of evil and that's like also the message um, that Malasan has in general to me and all of this is encompassed in this one sentence that Harlow says to himself Sibainisk, this is my mother after all this time when he has been waiting for her and hasn't lost his faith in her, she finally is here for him. And then he tells his friend who has died as well, look, that's her, that's my mom. And I feel like you just can't read this scene without feeling something here because <sighs> this really struck such a chord for me. And this one sentence that might not seem special out of context, there's this whole 
mother-son relationship and the relationship between Harlow and Beinisk as well that's hidden in these few words so whoa I don't know am I the only one who absolutely loves that sentence and was like really really emotionally impacted by it if you were as well please tell me now the next uh, final sentence um, I want to talk about is at the end of the crippled god Again, it's the last page of the last chapter, and that is when Icarium um, stands at um, Mappo's grave and he says, he died defending me, but I don't know who he was. And let me tell you, when I read that sentence for the first time, I kind of had a little breakdown because uh, I thought, like, really, this, this is how that's a storyline ends I can't and the sentence guys it in the sentence you have the essence of the whole relationship of Ikarium and Mapo so I mean Ikarium is a generally nice guy who has um been cursed with a horrible fate um and that is that he's losing his his memory again and again and Mapo is the one who is so devoted to him and um, no matter what and he uh, basically went on this long quest to reunite with Icarium and yeah be back at his side to protect him and then when he finally um, finds him again he even dies for him to protect him and he was willing to do everything for his friend and um, but Ikarium, he can't remember it. This like huge sacrifice that Mapo made for his friend and this relationship, it's, it's like it has never been. All this, the suffering of the characters and also of us as the reader, why we were rooting for Mapo and for Ikarium. And then in the end, I don't know who he was. Like... I, what, what, that's just, I couldn't handle that, I really couldn't, and um, of course Ikarium says in the end that he remembers something, but we don't know what it is, is it Mapo that he remembers, so, whoa, that scene, guys, so emotional, so, again, there are many other examples I could have named, like, Oh mother, look at us now um, in House of Chains or I lost her in The Crippled God or Oh my son, I accept from Tall the Hounds, just to name a few others. But yeah, um, this is just, I mean, it's it's just mastery if you ask me that you're able to write one sentence that carries so much weight and so much meaning and it just always lends those scenes that extra that in my opinion you do not find um with uh, a lot of other authors so okay the next uh, category i want to talk about is the reactions that characters have when witnessing a scene and I noticed that um, among scenes that are very emotional for me it was often one particular thing that a character does when witnessing that really stayed with me and um, I'm going to talk about a scene here and then it's probably or hopefully um, going to be clear for you what I mean. And that scene is from Tall the Hounds, by the way, Tall the Hounds. The ending, the final 200 pages are probably the best part of the series. And if I'm talking about emotional scenes, we could just talk about those final 200 pages for like an hour. But um one particular scene is when um, Anumander Rake uh, enters Dragonpoor um, and the reaction of Draconus. So um, there is one more person who enters the sword and then Hoot says, 
con consider this an act for forgiveness or no no a, a request for forgiveness and who who asks my forgiveness and then he realizes that rake is now among them and then when rake is sacrificing himself um and is like yeah wants to get mother dark to um move the gate and when draconus witnesses what rake is doing um he falls to his knees and that is just something that detail of the elder god draconus sinking down on his knees there is something so incredibly powerful about that um and then draconus says you ask my forgiveness when you unravel what i have done what i did so long ago when you heal what i wounded when you mend what i broke break there is no forgiveness you must seek not from me gods below not from any of us and then he also yeah kind of speaks to mother dark and he says mother dark i believe you must face him now you must turn to your children i believe your son insists he demands it open your eyes mother dark see what he has done for you for the testandi but not for himself see see and know what he has done and that's just to me that was one of the the scenes in uh, in Tall the Hounds during the ending when it's like reduced to those two characters Draconis and Drake the two uh, wielders of Dragnipur and Draconis begging Mother Dark to um do what Rake wants and just yeah finally yeah undo that uh, problem of Dragnipur and again it's it's also um the imagery of course um i'm gonna talk about <laughs> imagery in a second as well of course uh, the inside of dragnipur with uh, chaos and uh the uh, the army of the dead and the wagon being pulled no, or yeah it's not pull being pulled anymore but it's just that scene it's so cinematic and epic and memorable so whoa um then another uh character reaction that really got me is at the end of dead house gates um and it is um during that death scene of coltane and of course this whole scene is super intense um but what really really got me is nether's reaction when there's this moment when she starts screaming, when she realizes what um, is being done and that Col Coltane's soul is being prevented from leaving his body. And she starts to scream and starts to um, claw at her scalp and at her hair. And then Duiker, he rushes towards her and holds her in his arms, this girl, and um, to keep her from hurting herself further and gouging out her eyes. And that is just, you really feel um, the importance and the emotion of that scene through her because she is a Wiccan and she really feels that horrible atrocity that is being committed right now. And then also when um, Squint is um, brought into the scene and he struggles with himself because he, he doesn't want to shoot Coltane and then Nether is the one who begs him to release Coltane and then also uh, Squint uh, shoots and kills Coltane and then he says I killed Coltane Oberu have mercy on my soul and then you have all of the uh, crows flying in and collecting the soul of Coltane which is again an incredible image and then once he's gone Nether also falls down and after um, Duiker has been holding her, he also rushes in to hold Squint and uh, the old man crumbles in his arms and then Duiker thinks um, uh, that it has become a day to hold in his arms broken figures. But who will hold me? And yeah, that scene is... I know I've said 
before that the chain of dogs is not my favorite storyline from data skates but i still think that this ending scene is absolutely brilliant and just the reaction from others and then also finally the silence that descends um after coltane's death it says it all and then overhead the sky had begun to die coltane is dead they are all dead and yeah that's i think for many people um the first uh, malasan scene that really really hits you hard in the fields so yeah and it, it did it did hit me as well quite a bit so next i want to talk about imagery and there is one particular image that has really stayed with me for quite some time and it is in um memories of ice yes this book has a lot of tabs in it from uh my reread um and that is the moon's tears so um the first uh, scene that uh is really impacted by that is Corlat um when she is grieving for whiskey jack um so of course we have the situation that Corlat has finally flown down and assembled um because her brother told her that she should not hide in her dragon form from her grief and then she uh walks yeah under moonspawn basically and her eyes um fixing on the hilltop where i will find him all that is left that is that one thing that really struck me when i was just rereading that scene and i asked myself how did i not see that on my initial initial reread because the hilltop guys she will find him on the hilltop that's like at the end of the crippled god and holy crap that parallel and then of course as she has that little monologue where she uh, thinks about mother dark and is wondering if she's smiling now to to see her child so broken and then she looks up um towards moonspawn and that is when she starts to cry and um it is that scene um when it feels to her like um it is becoming more solid and more real uh, through the rain and then life drawn short to sharpen every detail, flush every color, to make every moment an ache. Whiskey Jack, my love. And then we also have the witnessing perspective of Colored and Brood, who then thinks that he can never forget that scene of Corlat crying below the moon's tears. And it's a, a mortal, a, a soul that has... Um, been made mortal once more and used to be of stone so <sighs> that scene woohoo and um then the next scene in which we also have um the moon's tears is it Kovian's death scene so um it Kovian's storyline is of course incredibly emotional as well um when he embraces the pain of the tlanimas and then um, we have a bit of background of his mother who is has been smiling when he left and then Dimas think that her smile or she and her smile um, they live on in him and that his mother is still smiling and then the Imas want to know why he has done that for them and then um, I believe what the scene wants to tell us is that there is no answer to that. The Imas also say that you do not answer our question, but you cannot. Because there is no reason as to why you give compassion to somebody. Compassion is priceless in the truest sense of the word. It must be given freely, in abundance. And there is, you cannot really say, I'm, I'm being compassionate to this person for a certain reason. No. That's not what it should be. Um, and it's just a gift, a gift that, that must be given. And then, um, of course, yeah, they say, you do not answer our question. No. Why? And then he falls back. Because I was the shield anvil. 
but now I am done. And beneath the moon's torrential rain, he died. That image of Etkovian dying below the moon's tears, that's... Again, that image, it's so emotional and cinematic, so... That was, I remember when I read Memories of Ice for the first time, I really could see that so vividly in front of my mind's eye of him falling down here and there is such an impact to those words. He died. I don't know. It's just made incredibly powerful by that whole imagery. So do you guys feel the same? I think without that, that scene wouldn't be nearly as memorable to me. So yeah. Um, the next um, category I want to talk about is the witnessing perspective of other characters. Um, and they do not even have to be um, directly involved. And that's going to become clear in that um, one scene that I've chosen here. And it's a scene that is probably very easily overlooked. Um, and it is in uh, Toll the Hounds again, um, when Anamanda Rake uh, arrives in Daruchistan in dragon form. And the one who witnesses his arrival is the coyote. And um, the coyote is the one, he doesn't have anything to do with that whole storyline. He couldn't be any less involved. But his life is going to be changed in that moment. And he realizes that Drake is special. And he feels something of what is about to happen. And um, then he trots out towards Rake and Rake touches him on the head briefly. And that has a tremendous effect on him. And that description was somehow one of the most emotional things in the series to me. So I'm I'm going to read it to you real quick so you can um, hear it in Ericsson's words. And off the beast bounded, running as fast as its legs could carry it, out into the night, the vast plain to the south, freed. Blessed beneficiary of such anguished love that it would live the rest of its years in a grassy sea of joy and delight. Transformed. No special reason. No grim purpose. No, this was a whimsical touch. A mutual celebration of life. Understand it or stumble through. The coyote's role is done. And off it pelts, hard, bright as a blazing star. Gifts to start the eye. And that's just, I don't know how it is possible that such a short paragraph about a coyote made me cry when I read it and made me think about that scene like three years after I had read it for the first time. And it just really, um, I think it's just um, a great prologue to what's about to happen because after this has happened, Rake is going to walk into Daruchistan to die. And um, he's going to sacrifice himself for his people. And a little bit of that um, sacrifice has also been transferred onto the coyote. And that's just my heart. It's like, it's such a little scene, but um, I, I find it really important and notable somehow. So... Yeah, <laughs> then um, the final category I want to talk about is um, when two, ca uh, two characters are interacting and also when there is a shared history between characters that influences a scene. Um, those are theoretically two different categories, but I decided to kind of um, put them together here because both apply in the scenes I want to describe. So the first one is again from Toll the Hounds. Um, and it is that scene when a Spinog fights Kalor and then he is mortally wounded and that is also that moment when he feels the death of Rake and he has feared that he would feel it and he does. And then in that moment um, he forces himself to smile and the cost of that smile to him is more than 
anything that he has done um, that night. And the reason for that is because it was the last thing that Drake asked him to do. Um, he told him, when that moment comes, do not weep. For me, try to find a smile to announce the end. And that is what he does. Um, even though he wants to cry, he just has to smile. There's nothing else that he can do because he cannot fail his master and his lord in that final thing that he asked of him. And, and you really feel the relationship of the Testandi and Rake in that scene. Because um, it might seem like Rake is asking uh, things from his people that should never be asked. And Kalor, he doesn't understand it. He um, is ranting a little bit and says that uh, Rake didn't deserve um, Spinock. But what he doesn't understand is that Rake has never asked anything of his people that he wouldn't also do for them. And in that moment, when Spinock is dying, that is also when Rake himself dies for his people. And it's like always an even exchange. That quote kind of fits here, doesn't it? And um, yeah, that scene, it's just Spinock himself. He's such a sweetheart. And that really hit me hard in the feels. So yeah. Um, then there's another scene that I feel like has to be mentioned when we're talking about emotional malasan scenes. Do you know which one I'm gonna talk about? Yes, Beak. Oh, Beak. And um, uh, first of all, before we get into the interaction part, um, I wanna mention the imagery here again real quick. When Faradan's sword finds Beak and she perceives him like a child hiding in a closet, a child seeking to make him, himself small, so small, big, gods below, big. And then um, Beak is actually um, welcomed by Hood, the um, god of death himself, at Hood's gate, and he tells the, him that his brother is waiting for him, but he will not recognize him yet. And then Beak uh, walks up to his brother and what he sees, so we have, of course, that, that background of the relationship between um, Beak and his brother. And we have learned that um, Beak's brother has committed suicide and Beak wanted to save him. And that was happening while Beak was playing with his uh, wax figures. Um, and he couldn't save him because he was too small. And then when he finally sees his brother again in Hoot's realm. His brother has prepared wax figures for him and they're all smiling. They're these happy wax figures that have been prepared to play. And yeah, then Beak says that they are beautiful and then he asks his brother, can I play with you? And <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> and then they're finally together, and yeah, can finally have a brotherly relationship and play together with happy wax figures. I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just. I just can't comment down below if you cried at Beak's death. <laughs> oh god. So then finally to kind of mm, finish the video with uh, something that's a little bit on the happy side is um, one scene in the series. It's the only scene that I can recall um, that made me cry tears of joy. And it is at the end of the Crippled God in um, the first prologue, uh, epilogue. Um, 
I actually read that scene before I finished um, The Crippled God because I just had to know. And when I read it, I started to cry tears of joy. <laughs> and it's um, when the uh, rest of the bridge burners and the Tistandi are sitting around that campfire. It just made me so happy because we have um, those two groups from Gardens of the Moon or, yeah, well, not all of them actually were in Gardens of the Moon, but it were the Bridge Burners and the Tist Andy that we started out with. So it's kind of a circle that has been closing. And um, then uh, Fiddler um, unwraps his fiddle and um, he says that he's going to play, uh, play and he's going to call Whiskey Jack back one last time. And then... Um, Corlat is told to go to the hilltop and that um, he will see her there and it's just again the hilltop I've mentioned it before and that scene it's just perfection to me I've been saying that I am not always a huge fan of the way that Erickson writes romances but I think this scene is done so incredibly well and yeah, I think I'm just just gonna read it to you again. Hilltop Corlett. Fitz gonna call him back. One more time. But listen, if it's too much, walk the other way. Or stay off the hill. He'll see you anyway. We're doing that bit no matter what. For him. He would have babbled on, but she moved past him. Eyes on the hill, on the other side of the road. Behind her, the strings drew a song into the night air. When she reached the road and saw her beloved standing on the hill before her. Call it broke into a run. And I think it's the perfect way to end this book with this image of her running to Whiskey Jack and they having this final reunion. And I was just so incredibly happy that that happened and they got this little scene together. And yeah, I love it. It's just, it's such a great ending. So yeah. With that, we have reached the end of today's video. I don't know how good of a job I did at describing those scenes or analyzing them. It was just mostly from an um, yeah emotional standpoint, honestly. <laughs> and um, if you have any more scenes uh, that touched you in an emotional way um, that I didn't mention, then I'd be a really curious to know what those scenes are so please uh, tell me in the comments and i hope uh, you enjoyed this video and i will see you next time bye